Welcome to Small Business Success Talks Summer of Strategy Series, where I interview guests to get their expertise in marketing and business development to help us all plan accordingly for the rest of 2023. Summer is a perfect time to evaluate how well, or maybe not so well, the year is going, determine what the gaps are, and learn from some of the best in the business building industry, their strategies and tactics to close the gap and build momentum in your own business and life. I am your host, Christy Smallwood, and let's get strategic. Well, George, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Small Business Success Talk. This is our Summer of Strategy series. Okay. And so I was so excited because you are one of my fellow uh, marketing podcast network people. So I'm really excited to have my my peer set come in and yes. share with my audience some great things that you're an expert at. So thank you for that. Now, question to start out with is what would you want people to know when you walk in the room? <laughs> um. No, I'm sorry. I, I got my hand. I, I was in an accident last week, so <laughs> apologize for the hand. Um, what would they want them to know when I walk in the room about me specifically or just in you or what you're bringing your business? What do you want people to already yeah. know? Um, I mean, I have a 25 year career in marketing and advertising. So typically if I'm walking in a room, I've been invited to walk in the room so that there's already some understanding of my my expertise and 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 what I've done, particularly in digital advertising and marketing. So um, what I would hope is is that you know they've done a little bit of of um, you know reading, just just some minor reading. If I'm giving a keynote or if I'm uh, if I'm on a panel or if I'm holding a session, and um, you know I, I'm hoping that they're curious and they want to find out more about you know why I or the agency that I lead did a certain thing a certain way or why we chose that creative or why we ran, you know, we did a paid campaign on TikTok, you know, for, for a client that particularly you wouldn't think of being on TikTok. Like those, those types of things, those tend to make the best sessions, the best information from a business standpoint. If I walk in a room and it's a prospective client, um, I do expect them to do their due diligence. You know, there, there's there's nothing worse than getting referred or or having someone invite you in and then ask a question, you know, ask like a table stakes question like, well, how long have you been in business? Or, you know, what type of work do you do? Like, well, if you don't know the type of work that we do, why did you invite us? Like it's 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 a ridiculous question in my opinion. So um and in, and in those regards because we're a small boutique agency of only seven people, um, if they don't have some level of, of interest or desire for our expertise or for a case study that they read about or so forth, it's a pretty good indication to me that they're just going through the motions mm -hmm. and they probably have someone already lined up and they have to satiate a C-level executive saying, well, you should really look at a few agencies or stuff like that. But that, that's what I expect when when I walk in a room, a little bit of due diligence being done. So, okay. Give me some background on your expertise. Now I know based on your bio and a couple of things that I've already looked up, yes. the digital space, you know, is definitely Correct. in that area politics. So digital space with politics, but what else, what do I not know about your expertise that we need to know? Um, I'm a recognized expert in social media marketing. So I have a number of firsts in my in my history um i led the first consumer packaged goods integration in social gaming on facebook so for stofers and for ed, ed dryers fruit bars which are now outshine we did integrations in farmville so first consumer packaged goods I saw that your bio was like oh, i love farmville <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean those are past now but at the time sure. um very early on when facebook first um, became public or you could when 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 people that were not a registered student at a university um, back in 2006 you could you could get on and get create a profile in 2007 for a regional restaurant chain in Pittsburgh called Eaton Park um, at the time on Facebook uh, uh, they had like apps where you could gift like you could gift um, like emojis to people 
And so this restaurant chain has what's called a smiley cookie. They're known for their smiley cookies. And we created a smiley cookie app where you could gift different colored smiley cookies to your friends on Facebook. So it was one of the first times that was ever done for, for a restaurant. So um, also using satellite data um, to identify new home builds that don't have um, decks and then targeting geographies where there are concentrations of homes that lack decks so that we could market Yellowwood, which is the only branded lumber that that had never been done before. Um, so there's a, there's a number of firsts in my career, but digital first, social media deep. I'm also recognized for um, our command and, and how we leverage social media listening for insight generation and making strategic decisions. So some examples of that are for Benjamin Moore Paint. They were trying to make a decision between Wayfair, Pottery Barn, Ikea, and one other retailer. And they really couldn't decide who to partner with. Well, through social media listening, we were able to identify that individuals that engage with Wayfair indexed 15 to 20 times more for being an expectant parent or a parent of, of an infant than the other realtors, which is something Benjamin Moore could leverage and say, okay, we can develop a, we can be the paint for Wayfair for expecting or new parents to do like a those baby nursery, like great, new which you wouldn't, groups. you yeah. wouldn't find out any other way through social media listening. You wouldn't get that through traditional market research. We also use that here to predict um, political campaigns. So we use social media listening to look at the volume of conversation, the sentiment of the conversation, the, the passion behind the conversation, what level of passion exists. And um, regularly we correctly forecast um, winners and losers in political campaigns using social media listening. Fascinating. So you're <laughs> socially, so this is my interpretation of it. You're just people watching and taking it all in to then determine what your next move should be. Cause you're just, it's almost like an extension of consumer behavior, but listening to the conversation. Correct. Okay. Correct. And there's, there's much more. In fact, we use indexing. So I gave a talk, I gave a talk at the digital summit in Philadelphia two springs ago and the big races, the big races in Pennsylvania at the time were for, um, Oh, I apologize. Um, we're for governor and for, um, for, for governor and for Senate. And I demonstrated how you can use social media listening. Like if you're running a campaign, you're a political consultant, we can do indexing of social media conversations and I can identify if a candidate is under indexing, um, against another candidate or general general Twitter population among African Americans, among Hispanics, among men, women, um, among, among certain professions. Like I can identify if a candidate is is indexing above population among accountants, lawyers, medical professionals, laborers. So it's a great tool from a not only for a communication strategy for a political campaign or an issue advocacy campaign, it's also just a great strategic tool overall to look at. Yeah, I love that. And, and I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, why do I not have that tool in my own business? I was like, oh, wait, that's right. The, <laughs> we do other things, not this. Got it. Uh, right. Okay. So what, can, I because I can, I keep hearing a little bit of excitement in there. What keeps you on fire for doing what you do? Yeah, it's, why, it's, why it's do a, you like I've this been thing? doing it a long time. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's a, it's a good question. Um, the reason I started fifth influence was to really marry I have a degree in political science. I'm 52. So we're talking back 93. I graduated with a degree in political science. I was accepted at American to do my PhD. Um, but over the summer decided I wasn't going to pursue my PhD. So I worked in, in politics for a couple of years in DC. And then when I came back to Pittsburgh, um, 
none of the law firms had lobbying practices here. Like I couldn't do what I was doing in DC here. And my, my wife brought me back here. So I built a career in advertising. So after building that career, I wanted to fuse my passion in, in issue advocacy and politics with my expertise in digital marketing and advertising. And so what keeps the fire going is, is my passion to see certain, um, certain legislation passed, like paid family leave. The um, Family Care Act at this agency, we rebranded that act here in Pennsylvania from paid family leave to the Family Care Act, knowing it would resonate across both parties because family is not about, it's not paid leave just for, for paid leave. It's, it's, it's about caring for your family. Right. Um, seeing legislation like that pass, um, working on issues for LGBTQ plus working on issues in regards to, um, uh, policies that, uh, policies that hinder the ability for people that are unstable, uh, or for the for the acquisition of um, high capacity firearms, um, which you know, I mean, people go to gun control. That's why I'm being careful in regards to how I articulate it. Right. Um, when it comes to women's rights, particularly around um, the the right to choose whether to have an abortion or not, those right. things keep me keep me fired up. And then in digital, anyone that's a that's a practitioner in digital marketing, it changes every day. The platforms have gotten, I mean, since the mid-2000s, they're much, much better about education, communication regarding how they change things and what they're doing. But it does change every single day, and it's fragmented. And so I believe in lifelong learning. I'm someone that believes you have to wake up every day understanding that, you know, Business is changing. The world is changing. You know, in our in our sphere, it changes every day. You have to read constantly. You have to always be learning, and that that keeps me fired up too. And and I'm not an expert. I'm a digital marketing expert, but across our seven person team, we have experts in individual platforms because it's impossible for one any one individual to be an expert in all the different platforms that are available. That's like asking a medical professional, like a general practitioner and say, oh, well, why can't you do heart surgery? Why, why aren't you, why aren't you an oncologist? Why aren't you, because it would be impossible for one person to be expert in all those facets uh, of, of medical care. It's the same thing in digital, mar digital marketing. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And, it, and of course, having this conversation, I've been thinking about my own space in my own, my own team, like where I fit in the team. And, and I'm like, yeah, cause even I can't keep up and I yeah. need to be that person in, in my business. So even my own business is like transforming. Um, but it's like, man, he is so right. Everything has changed like so fast. And then that now there's new stuff and how to keep up with all of the things. So using right. your expertise and your background, knowing that this is a small business show, we talk about small businesses. Yeah. What what would be some of the best advice you could give them? Since small business is like our hometown heroes, right? How do we, what's the best advice you could give them? Right. Well, I mean, being a small business owner, um, regardless of the business that you're in, it, you have to have command, some level command of so many parts of your business, cash flow, accounting. Uh, you got the whole finance side, right? Invoicing. Um, the, the biggest advice I give to small business owners is even though you may delegate your accounting, you may delegate your invoicing, you still have to stay intimately involved in, in the financial facets of your business. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have command of your financial facets and in running an advertising agency, one of the things that I pride myself on is what's, what I call agency economics, how, how to run. a it's, it's difficult to run a profitable agency. Um, most advertising agencies in, in America, they typically manage to somewhere about 20, 14 to 20 points of profit at the end of the year. And that's really tough because we're a human resource intensive business. So you really, really have to watch your, your financials closely um, to be profitable. And so that, that's number one. Secondly, um, as you grow operationally, 
you can't be expert. You can't be an expert in in every operational facet of, of the business, and you have to be comfortable in delegating and holding people accountable to to get those things done. So we have creatives here. I have media planning and buy. I have media planning and buyers. I have strategists, account people, and I hold them accountable. Like I am not personally doing the design on every client. It's not feasible. I don't want to do it. I'm building a business and I delegate and then I spot check that design. And so spot checking, delegating, and then spot checking to make sure that they're hitting the, the, whatever, whatever the measure of excellence is in your small business. If you're a retail store, that could be customer service. If you're an agency, it's customer service and the quality of the deliverable product. If it's professional services, it's the quality of, of if you're doing a strategy, the quality of that strategy, making sure that your team members know what the bar is, you provide examples, you educate, and then hold them account, accountable to that bar from a small business. So number one, financials. Number two, operationally delegating, but making sure that you're spot checking and it's, it's meeting. And then number three, we deal with so many... Um, challenges it's easy it's easy to get discouraged in a single day you can have an employee issue clients in our business it's client driven it's a client service business i love all of our clients it doesn't mean that there's not just like in a marriage there's ups and downs and there's dynamics so in any given day there may be a dynamic with a certain client and you're helping the team manage through that um maybe you know a, a client doesn't decides not to pay their invoice and then that's a financial like or they're delayed or they have a cash flow like so it's easy to get discouraged as a small business owner um because unlike a very big company where if you're a ceo you can delegate a lot you can delegate but there's still core core things that you have to get involved in and so those would be the three things stay close to the financials um, delegate operations, but make sure that, that a level of excellence, whatever that means in your business is being met and, and ensuring that it's being met. And then third, don't get discouraged because in any given day, there's probably going to be one to three things that happen that are negative. <laughs> and, and I'm hearing, I'm like, surprisingly enough, because I really thought you were going to go with in a marketing direction. Leadership is a big deal. Like I have... I've won awards, but I've also done a lot. I've received a lot of leadership training and I train on leadership and it's such a big component of being able to be a successful business owner. Yes. And because there's so much that goes into leadership, it's not just leadership for the sake of having a title of a leader. It's being able to, like you said, delegate and spot mm -hmm. check like give those people who are gifted in what they're doing to do the thing. Like don't micromanage, but spot right. check, right? Quality check is good. Stay right. out of the weeds. Go do what you're gifted at. Like that right and there. You have to be, I mean, you have to inspire. So, you know, your, your greatest strength is also your greatest weakness. So I tend to be, um, I'm very opinionated. I'm, I'm loud. Um, like I'm a great coach. Okay. At the same time, that, that strength can also be a weak, a weakness because in our, in our, I mean, I chose our name fifth influence. I easily could have left and started the agency and just put my last name on it, which is what most people do when they start an advertising agency. They just put their name on the door. The challenge with that is I wanted to build a business that's respected that the work speaks for the agency, not my personal reputation. And I wanted to separate it. And then that allows the team to have input in regards to how we're building and what we're doing and 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 the type of excellence we want to achieve. Like there's more buy-in than just with my name on the door. So leadership, leadership's a big leadership's a big part of it. Um at the same time, depending on the type of leader that you are, because I know because because of my background, I, I sometimes I even know more than our staff in certain areas, and I have to make sure not just to complete it or take it over. 
And that's part of leadership. Part the, you know, I think the biggest part of leadership is knowing when to pull back and letting people fail. Oh my gosh, that's so hard. Or make mistakes. It's I've grown a lot more accustomed to it because I've I learned really early on what do I really care about? Is it the process or the end result? And you know, they're gonna screw up like they wouldn't do it the way that I would do it. That's right. But I do want the end result. Correct. And I, but the people, the owners that I work with in coaching haven't got the hang of that very often. And so they're very fixated on, they have to do it a certain way. When in fact, if they would just step back, this person could have completely got it done faster, better without doing it the right. Yeah, their way. Right. And mm -hmm. when we do assessment here, um, we use objectives and key results. And so three objectives in each position are completely dictated by me based on their position. Mm -hmm. Three are mutually agreed upon. So we talk about, okay, in your role, how do you want to grow? What do you want to do? And then we mutually agree on those objectives. And then three, they can pick completely on, on their own. And then I manage, I meet every week with each team member for 15 minutes to 30 minutes and it's like a small coach. We go over the OKRs, we see where they're at and their progress. And then assessment with objectives and key results. The result is not, I mean, the result is not just measured by me. The result may be measured by their peers for a certain function or objective. It may be a client scorecard where a client is scoring them. And then that way the coaching is other inputs than just my, it's my personal opinion, it's a professional opinion, but you can show them client feedback. You can show them. And so if they're stumbling in a certain area and it's demonstrated from three of the seven clients that they're engaged with or four of the seven, you can say, okay, like let's talk about why these three or four clients all provided similar feedback in regards to this Delta that you have in, in this facet of your, of, uh, of your job. And then we talk about that. So yeah. Love that. Love that. Okay. So strategically then, so let's say a, a business owner has never even touched a strategic plan. Like they started their business because they <laughs> enjoyed doing what they want to do. Right. Um, right. Which is what 85, 90% of them out there. And there's nothing wrong with that, but now they're at a place in their business of, Ooh, maybe I need to like think this through a half second. <laughs> what aside from uh, what you've already given us, which is gold. And I thank you for that. What is something like in that marketing realm that they need to consider like as a top priority? Yeah. So, um, well, number one, if anyone that starts a business and they don't have, like we have a three-year strategic plan and then we update it every three years. If you're starting a business, you should do a strategic plan out of I, the gate. For those who can't see the video, I have been so <laughs> hearting that. Big time. Thank you. Yeah. You need, <laughs> you need a guiding document. We call it true North because things change, right? Like during COVID we had 12 clients going into COVID all 12 called us and, and froze spending. And so we had a pivot. Yeah. We're like, okay, we don't have any, we don't, we don't have any paying clients. We have to pivot. Our true North is, is issue advocacy and political work. But at that point in time, we were going to keep the doors open and, and make payroll we were going to have taken clients outside of our true north. And so you pivot, but the, our document hasn't changed. We're still focused on that. From marketing, from a marketing and advertising standpoint, um, it, it all depends on the business that you're in and how you acquire clients. Um, that should that should dictate what your marketing, what's in your marketing plan. So let's let's Dude, yeah, let's like, let's break that down a hot. Let's compare, yeah, yeah, let's compare like, and contrast. Sales, that's right? what sales are for, right? Sales. Yeah. So you let's know? take let's compare a retail small bicycle shop. When I say small, not small bicycle, but a but a but a, a, a independent bicycle shop, okay, with um, a professional sir, an, a, an attorney who left a big firm is now on their own. Sure. All right. Yes. That bicycle shop, the two biggest measures for that bicycle shop are going to be foot traffic. In, well, it's not, well, that's more of a restaurant. It, it is foot traffic, but it's going to be, if you're an independent bicycle shop, 
you make all your money from services. There's there's no margin on, on selling bikes. Bikes are sold pretty much at cost. So what you need to do is you need to develop relationships with individuals that ride bikes who need their bicycle repair, which most bicycles need tuned up on an annual basis, right? So in that case, if that's who you need, then digital advertising is a vehicle that you can look at because you can target people that are interested in certain bike brands that are interested in certain cycling. Um, here in Pittsburgh, we have what's called the Great Allegheny Passage, which is a famous bike trail between here and the Mason-Dixon line. And then it's the CNO Canal after that, that you can go all the way to DC. You can target people that are passionate about that, that trail. And that way you can create awareness, drive interest, inquiries about that. If you're a lawyer, and let's say you leave a law firm and you're a divorce attorney, okay, and you want to build a divorce practice, how are you going to find those individuals? And most divorce attorneys that leave a big practice, they don't want any divorce. They want people, they, they want people that have that are highly compensated because that's where that's where their fees come in, and that's where a lot of the conflict comes in over how the money gets distributed, right? So in that case, if you're if you left a big firm and you're a divorce attorney and you you could target affluence. And so you could target the top 10% of, of um, household household income across, the, like whether it's streaming or digital or so forth, or maybe you're going to take a, a, a full page ad out in Forbes, because you know, people that read Forbes tend to be in the top 20% of annual income. And so the biggest part of marketing is identifying your target audiences segmenting them if you can. And let's take Bob Evans. Bob Evans is not a small business, but Bob Evans was my client for seven years at, at Bruner. We had three key audience segments to drive foot traffic and raise check size. One, what we called the I-95 corridor, which were business travelers. And in the summer, family family vacation travelers. Then they had a we had another um, target audience, which was lower socioeconomic rural families that wanted to eat out once or twice a month, and, but needed to go to a place that was affordable that they they could actually you know go and and afford to eat out. So that was a target audience. And then this is ter- this is a terrible name we call we called it this. Um, but the third target audience, and it wasn't called this by by Bob Evans. I don't want, but it was like a nickname. We called it God's Waiting Room. Seniors love Bob Evans. My dad's 91, my mother's 86, not using person, but a big part of their breakfast crowd are are seniors. It is their coffee and house. It, yeah. And it's not just like 65, like they tend to be a little bit even older, right? Because they're on limited incomes. They have to be very careful in regards to how often they go out and spend. But seniors, so those were our three target audiences. And then once we had those identified, we could draft marketing and advertising programs to reach and intersect those audiences, raise consideration of Bob Evans over other alternatives like Cracker Barrel, like um, uh, Denny's, et cetera. And then once we raise consideration, actually drive them into the restaurant, which which is foot traffic. And then once they're there, how do we raise checks? Because the biggest, two biggest things in restaurant in the restaurant business is you need foot traffic. And then once they're in the restaurant, then you focus on increasing the check size. So if you take that an, uh, analogy to any small business, who are your target audiences? You know, who's good, who's going to drive the most business for you at the most high, highly profitable business that you can acquire? Segment those. And then once you segment them, What's the most efficient way to reach them? Because the other thing in doing your marketing and advertising plan is we all have limited resources, right? Mm-hmm. And we get calls from clients all the time and they say, oh, well, you know, we want to do a Facebook campaign. Tell me how much to spend. And I'm <laughs> like, no, I'm not going to tell you how much to spend. Yeah. How much do you have to spend? Like, I know you have limited resources and whatever plan I put together, you're not going to be able to afford anyway. So tell me what you have. And then I'll tell you what's possible. What is the most efficient spend? So when a small business owner puts their marketing program together, target audience is segmentation. And then for each of those segments, or maybe you can't even hit all three segments or four segments. Maybe you're going to prioritize one segment first, master that segment, reach them, engage them, pull them into the business, and then move to the next segment. But what is your, what are your financial resources to make that happen? 
don't go to an agency or don't hire a kid and bring them in and have them tell you how much to spend. I hate that. Like, I get that question a lot as well. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what exactly you're trying to accomplish other than sales. So let's have the conversation. Like, I don't know enough to be able to answer that. Um, but I'm also loving the fact that you don't stop with just get your target audience. It's segment them like, Oh wait. So we don't just look at male or female 35 to 64 that drive cars. No, I need to know (laughs) what are the life moments in which they are going to think about needing you? Like that's how I need to know my target audience so well. That's right. And getting to those points, like how, how do you even do that? Yeah. First party for taking it, for instance, for, for, for a small business owner, the most valuable, one of the most valuable assets they can collect is a database that builds on knowledge about who they do business with prospects and clients. The more they know, because first party data is extremely important because that can be uploaded into a social media platform to create a lookalike audience. So say you're you're a divorce attorney and you've been in business for two years and you have all these clients and you have their emails. Well, you could upload that into TikTok and it would find people that look similar to those people. Now, not all those people may get divorced, but 50% of marriages end in divorce. So if you want affluent people that have the potential to get divorced, what better way to identify those than a lookalike audience from who you're already working with? And the more you know about them, the better off you're going to be. And in most small, I, I would hope, I would hope that most small business owners know that collecting data is one of the most critical parts of what they should be doing as a business owner about their clients and their prospects. My research friend, uh, Chris Bombright with Curiosity Consulting would be highly praising you right now. <laughs> his whole life is all about the data. And I, I think through some of my small business clients who, who didn't even have a zip code of their p- people, of their guests in the store. So we had no idea how far they would be willing to drive That's right. to come experience this. I was like, huh? So data is definitely important. Okay. So before we start to get to the the end of our conversation, yeah. what are some examples of things not to do? Like what are what are red flags, warning symbols? Don't do this. Yeah. Um in, in in you know, a lot of small businesses will have relationships with individuals and like like take a local magazine, for instance. Like I live in a municipality outside of Pittsburgh. Um, called Mount Lebanon. There's a small magazine run by the municipality called Mount Lebanon Magazine. Um, unless my business is, say, unless, you know, there's not a good reason to do advertising in that magazine unless there's, it's critical that I'm in that magazine, right? And so personal relationships come into it. Their personal perceptions in regards to what platforms to be on, like they should walk back and think from the, from the, not the owner perspective, but the audience perspective. Like if your target's a 22 year old male who is recently out of school and makes 32,000 to $40,000, their behavior is dramatically different than your behavior. Their two primary social platforms are TikTok and Instagram. So you focusing on Facebook is not helping you at all. Right. right. Like it's really thinking from the audience perspective in regards to the media they consume, what they do, how they make decisions and not base it on your your personal um, behavior, viewpoints, et cetera. I'll give you a great example. So we work with a personal injury law firm, which is not our true north, but he's he's a good friend and 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 we like working with him. Well, he's. Gen X, like I'm Gen X, and it, it we it, have a slowly different over the last year. Slowly <laughs> over the last year, it's, it's it's he's understood like the majority of his target audience now are millennials, mm-hmm. and a big part of being like like things have changed, right? So we did a blog post. We knew it was going to drive a lot of traffic to the website, but we did a blog post on 
workers' compensation related to marijuana use. And when I say workers' compensation, like if you get injured on the job, what are your legal rights if you're a recreational marijuana user? Because recreational marijuana is legal in, in many states and in Pennsylvania where he practices you as long as you get a medical card you can which it's easy to get a medical card to 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 partake in in marijuana we knew that article was going to do well he was very adamant you know in saying i i don't want to do this article i don't have a lot of cases like this i'm like no you don't understand this is just one means of creating awareness among a target audience which is important to you and yes you may not take a lot of cases like this but when they do hurt their hand physically or their leg or something, they're going to think of you because of this article. Or we did we did another blog post on millennials in the workplace and workers' compensation. He's like, well, why do we? Why are they getting special treatment? Why are we calling them out? We're like, because there's actual searches. <laughs> like it's just it just passes. So when you say, what do you do from a marketing standpoint? In my experience, small business owners, because of the passion they have and why they started the business is sort of clouds how they think about their target audiences, mm -hmm. who they are, how they behave in, 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 you know, cause they, they think from their perspective because of their passion, not necessarily who can use their service or their product and, and so forth. But this, that's a great example because it's taken a year to convince our client that millennials are actually, I mean, millennial, I mean, Gen X is like a shadow, like Gen X is like this small, right? Uh -huh. Boomers aren't in the workplace anymore. Like you are a workers' comp attorney. That's what you do. So boomers are gone. Gen X is this. If you don't start focusing on millennials and in, in how they work, like we did another blog post on um, like Uber and Lyft and, and those types of employment, because that's very unique workers' compensation law. Sure. And again, it was, well, I'm not going to get cases from this. I'm like, no, you <laughs> won't get a case for an Uber driver because technically they're an independent contractor. But by demonstrating your knowledge of this unique position that this worker's in, if they get injured somewhere else in another role, they're going I'm to come into you. Of, right? I I don't know how many times I've used the phrase, you are not your target audience. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Like it's not about you. <laughs> right. It's, I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not. So, I mean, in, in what we do here, it's a little bit different because we wear our politics on our sleeve and we're aligned with a lot of positions, but Billy Joe, our lead designer, who's one of the, um, I, I, I don't want to misspeak, but I believe he's one of the top five drag queens in Pittsburgh. He's very, he's very close to the LGBT, LGBT, Q plus community. I, I hate him already because I'm positive he can wear heels that I can't. So yeah, <laughs> and so like he has insights and he has and and that's a big part of our target. I'm a 52 year old heterosexual male. It's not. I'm not same. very attuned to that to that audience audience, but it's a bit. It's an ex extremely important audience to us, given given our agency positioning. It's extremely important. I'm passionate about those positions. I just don't live those positions every day. Right. It's how, how do you get inside the head of somebody who is not you? Right. That's right. And we got to learn how to do that the best we can forget ourselves and then make it right. all about you. Right. And then that drive, that drives everything else. So when it comes to marketing advertising, it really starts with target audiences, their behavior, segmentation, their behaviors, you know, so forth. And then get into the tactical because so many small business owners focus on small, ta like I want to be in this magazine or I want to be on Facebook or, I, you know, TikTok, like my daughter's on TikTok. I should be on TikTok or I'm going to have my daughter put us on TikTok. And I can't tell you, like, especially given that we do digital and social media, I can't tell you how many, even not small businesses, like some pretty medium sized businesses. And they're like, oh yeah, my, my, my son makes make, makes some TikToks at college. And I'm like, your son making TikToks is not the same as being your company on TikTok. Like it's not even close to the same. No, no, yeah. not even close. All right, George, one last question for you. Cause I, I'm curious and I want to keep up with my friends here. So what's on the horizon for you and your business? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So growth, I mean, 
if you're not growing, you're dying. So we're a seven person agency. Um, we're slated to do our goal is 1.2 million in revenue this year. Nice. We'll like to do, we should come close. We'll see. So, but it's hitting revenue goals. So on our three year plan, which we're year in, we want to be at the end of three years, somewhere between five and 7 million in revenue probably will be about 14, 15 um, people. So we'll double the size of, uh, we'll double the size of the staff client wise. Our goals are um, from a political campaign standpoint, we've done well the last year. Um, they're mostly considered down ballot races though. So what that means is they're not, it's not a federal congressional seat. It's not a federal Senate seat. It's not a good It's more regional and not just in Pennsylvania. There, there are regional races in different places. So, um, but a goal from a client goal is it's getting a federal congressional race or a federal Senate race um, in the doors. Um, it's getting a national issue advocacy organization in the doors. And not that we haven't had that. We've had two globals in the past in regards to sustainability. We're currently not under contract with them, but but a well-known, sizable national issue advocacy group that sits on the left side of the political spectrum, that's what we're focused on. So it's business development and growth is really the focus. And then maintaining a big believer in current clients should not be sacrificial lambs to future goals. Exactly. And so it's maintaining the excellence with our current clients while we continue to to grow the agency and have more clients in the, in the true north of clients that we want. And then George, what do you need to do to be able to facilitate that? <laughs> um, just like any business owner, if I could, if I could clone myself, if I could stay up 24 <laughs> seven, if I could, if I could change um, physics and have days be 48 hours, is that 24 hours, you know, um, but at 52, I think the most important things for me to do is, and I don't want to use the term balance because there is no balance in being a business owner. I probably work 70 to 80 hours a week, um, not always in the office, but there, I don't think there's ever a waking moment that that the business is not on my mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's eating healthy. It, it's it's staying physically fit. It's staying healthy to continue to run the, the business. I mean, there's six people that, that are here that rely on me to, to continue to, to do that. And I, and I have a great example from, so last week I was on vacation in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, paddle boarding with my daughter uh-huh. and um, a rare, small and random oyster bed was in the middle of the channel. And my daughter was only 10 feet beside me, but I hit it, my fin caught it. So I fell on it and gash the main artery. Oh, oh. Yeah, like I have, so, Gosh. but it gashed the main artery in my hand. We were 40 minutes out. And luckily about 15 minutes after this happened, a boat came by because if, it, if a boat didn't come by, it would have bled out. I would have never made it back. So, you know, it, it gives you pause, right? And, and we had a client in the middle of something. And so from the bed in the emergency room, two hours prior going into a three hour surgery, I'm texting the the client saying, Hey, I'm going into surgery. I'm going to be under anesthesia for two to three. Like I'm not available. You have to, you know, and and technically during those two to three hours, my wife, you know, it's, and again, it's, I'm not making, like, it sounds like, you know, making it's, 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 but it's important, you know, during those two, three hours that I was incapacitated, nothing critical here was going to happen, but technically legally, my wife was running the agency. I wasn't running the agency. My wife's a school teacher. She doesn't know anything about right. advertising agency. Less or so, <laughs> you know, what, you know, the biggest thing for me is I'm a big downside planner. So like we have proper insurance here, disability insurance. Like, so if something happens to me, our overhead is met. like, if I can't perform as the leader of the agency, there's a disability policy that covers the overhead of the agency. So everyone gets paid. It can continue. It's looking at other things like, like if I am incapacitated for two to three days, who's, who's put in charge, like that's not in place. Right. So it's, it's thinking about downside planning. I don't think many business owners think about downside. Plan- I mean, we're all invincible. We're all, sure. Brilliant. We're all welcome to welcome to Gen X. Like, yeah, I mean, we're all. I mean, 
business owners tend to have, they're charismatic, they have big egos. I mean, it's just like running for office. Like you don't run for office unless you're an egomaniac, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Like we need that. It's the same thing in running a business. Like you don't run a business thinking you can't run it, right? The big question is, is what happens when you can't? Because there could be times that you can't run it. How do you maintain it? And so staying healthy, um, keeping my mind always fit. I do different types of games, but really downside planning. Like, you know, how does the business, and it's not succession. It's literally like short-term downside plan. Like if I, if, if I'm in an accident, like, like what happened last week and I can't work for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, what, what happens? Right. Or even, and, you know, something even more like you're on a mission trip in the middle of the Amazon no cell right. service, right? Who right. covers the executive decisions while you're not available? Well, that's correct. Yeah. No, it's yeah. A, it's great. I'm, and again, thank you for that. I was like, oh yeah, I, it's been on my list of things to do, but do I have that in place? Not to the point that I need it and certainly don't want my mom to take over. So <laughs> I want to get on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nobody that's funny. Really needs that. So. <laughs> Well, George, thank you so much for sharing with me today in our yeah. strategy series. I look forward to uh, continuing to keep up with you and fifth influence, Absolutely. And what you guys are doing in the world. So thank yeah, you and a shout out, I mean, in regards to MPN. So our podcast is called um, you jag off on fifth. So just a little plug. Uh -huh. The Jagoffs have their own podcast called the jag off podcast in Pittsburgh. They're the number one podcast in Pittsburgh, Rachel Rennebeck. John Chamberlain. Um, we do I'm some actually going to have Rachel on soon. Yeah. So, yeah. Rachel's awesome, right? Um, we decided to get together and do a business-focused podcast. And what we do is we use Pittsburgh, we, we use analogies from Pittsburgh to talk about business lessons. And so like everyone here calls a shopping cart a buggy. Oh, yeah. So we have a podcast saying, you know, if, you, if you're running a business, what needs to be in your buggy? All right. I think that's um, the episode I listened to. <laughs> maybe it might, it might be, but we have, we have a whole series of, of podcasts that take um, Pittsburgh ease. It's called, it's called Pittsburgh ease and then uses it to, to demonstrate a, a business lesson or case study or something like that. So that's awesome. Yeah, jag off on fifth. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll have that included in the show notes for the awesome. site. So awesome. everybody can go listen to that. Thank you again, George. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. You have a great day, Christy. You too. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for the Summer of Strategy series on Small Business Success Talk. Remember to share us with your network, leave us a great review, and subscribe for the latest episodes.